Hello, my name is Gaia Carmilla and I'm policy research at Vocal Europe. On today's podcast interview, we will discuss about the relation between European Union and Africa, how narratives shape politics and citizen perception, and how the EU can play a role in development cooperation in Africa. We are honored to be joined by Professor Patrick de Veltere, Professor at the Faculty of Social Science at KU Leuven and Chairman Board of Director, Research Institute for Work and Society at KU Leuven. It is a pleasure to have you here, Professor de Veltere. Thanks for having me. Just uh, to begin with, I would like to approach the concept of narrative. And uh, I think narrative has been shaped by wrong and correct narratives in literature, television, social, social media, journals, and academic literature. How much did narrative affect diplomatic, political, economic relations? And what have been the consequences on EU-Africa relations? Yes, of course, narratives have influenced the relation between Europe and Africa a lot, huh? Uh, in the positive sense, but also in the negative sense. And I think uh, mainly in the negative sense, in the sense that, for example, um, Africa has always been depicted as being one country as a whole. If you we were talking about Morocco or Malawi or South Africa, we said this is Africa. And we always had a kind of an essentialist approach in the sense that we said, this is Africa. This is how Africa is, and this is how Africans are. Of course, if somebody would apply that to Europe and say Europe is Sweden, it's Luxembourg, and it's Bulgaria, and somebody would say this is how the Europeans are, this is how the society is in Europe, people would say no, 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 no way, because the Swedes, they're so much different from the people from Luxembourg and so much different from the people from Bulgaria. In the case of Africa, again and again, we have said this is how Africa is and this is how the Africans are. Of course, this has had a lot of implications also in the way we treated with Africa because uh, we took Africa as, as one country, as one region, as one culture, as one tradition and, and, and so on. So we, we did not accept the diversity of Africa. The, sec the second thing also that has gone very wrong in our way of talking about Africa is that we talk about Africa as being dependent, as a continent that is lagging behind, as a set of countries, and there are 40, uh, 55 countries in, in, in Africa, as, as, a, as a continent that collectively is dependent. Every single country, every single region, every single African individual even is dependent on international development cooperation, for example, or on the, the well-doing of the donors and the well-doing of Europeans, Americans, Japanese, now increasingly ja uh, Chinese and, and so on. So our focus on, uh, is on the deficiencies, on the, on the gap, on the things that are not there. And so we don't treat Africa on the basis of the opportunities, on the strengths, on the things that can be done, on the things that are working well. So there again, also our diplomatic international relation very often is only focusing on what is going wrong. Uh, of course, there are conflicts in Africa, there are deficiencies, but aren't there also in Europe? Aren't there also in the United States? Aren't there also in, 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 in China? Sometimes, it, 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 is, it is right. And I think increasingly and in recent years, we start to realize that we have to change the narrative because the reality is different. The reality is much more, much more positive. Eh? We become dependent, for example, on, on Africa. We become dependent on Africa because of demographic reasons and other ones. But first of all, the demographic reasons the 1.3 billion Africans right now, we have four, 450, maybe 500 uh, uh, million uh, Europeans. It means that in 2100, there will be over 4 billion African people. There will be only be 400 million European people. It means that the next market is not Asia, it's not Latin America, it's not United States and Canada, it will be Africa. And we see a booming economy 
in a, quite a number of countries, amongst the best performing economies in the world, you find African economies. So we have to change indeed the narrative from an Africa that is dependent on the external world and notably on Europe and United States to a narrative that accepts and realizes that the future of the world will be shaped by Africa. It means also that we have to, to change uh, not only our narrative, but also that we have to work differently with the African continent and with the African people. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So you refer to a new narrative leading to a global citizenship. Uh, why do you claim you already said more or less there's a need for a new narrative? But moreover, what this uh, new narrative uh, will lead to and what are the consequences of this new narrative? I think the, 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 the fact is that, let's say, the, la the last five to ten years, the other continents and the other countries have rediscovered, or for some of them, discovered Africa. Rediscovered because they already thought they were in contact with and they had relations with, and, and, and that was uh, beneficial to both sides. Eh? For other ones, it was a new thing, so they, 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 they discovered Africa for the, for the first time. Eh? But all of the other continents have seen that the future lies in the hands of Africa. If you take, for example, Europe, Europe has proximity with Africa that no other single continent has. There's a, there's a, a geographical proximity. There's only 14 kilometers distance between Europe and Africa. And as I said, in the near future, we will have 400, 450 million Europeans and 4 billion Africans. So it has its consequences. It's only 14 kilometers distance. We share a, num a number of environmental hotspots. The Mediterranean is the most important one, but it's not the only one. We know that in the future and already today, we have to really rethink the way we work in this, in, in, uh, on, on this globe and the consequences it has on climate change, on environmental degradation. We know the way we live and the consequences it has on climate change and environmental degradation. So we will have to do it together with the Africans. We also have a kind of economic proximity because so far Europe is the biggest investor in Africa. If you look at foreign direct investment in terms of stock, it's still Europe that is the most important one. We have been overtaken a couple of years ago by China in terms of foreign, uh, foreign uh, direct investment flow. But still, Europe is the biggest investor in, in Africa. Also in terms of remittances, in terms of other flows, financial flows to Africa, Europe is the most in, uh, important one in terms of trade, for example, in terms of aid and, and so on. And then also we have this societal proximity. The Africans speak their own languages. There are a couple of thousand languages in Africa, but most Africans are multilingual, something we do not realize very often, but most Africans master three, four or five different languages, amongst which very often also European languages, be it French, English, uh, Portuguese, even, even Spanish. Yeah? Those are European languages. So we also have this kind of societal proximity, also in terms of intermarriages, in contacts, and, and so on and so forth. So the new narrative implies that we realize our humble position as Europe vis-a-vis -vis Africa. And we start to think about the opportunities that Africa has, the dynamism that Africa has, the potential that Africa has, and that that is the starting point to work with Africa and not the deficits, and not the fact that we think that we are modern and that Africa is not as modern and that we can guide them towards modernity. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Uh, in the last year, a new partnership has been developed between Africa and European Union. So should you rethink this relationship and 
but also both continents are facing new threats and challenges. Hence, there will be the need for new strategies. Well, I think the, the new partnership, in fact, is, is, is not new in the sense that there was nothing before. Eh? So the, it's in, in fact, it's part dependent, it, it's, it's, it's a continuity. But I think that the, the, the new agenda that was launched in 2018 by President Juncker, the then com uh, President of the, co of, the, of the Commission, the new alliance of Africa and Europe is really the right atmosphere, the right narrative, also the right uh, strategy, is recognizing the fact that Europe has this special relationship with Africa. Recognize the fact that a lot has been done and that we have to learn from our mistakes, but that we have to do things in a, in a different way. What is happening, I think, right now? Indeed, things are changing all the time, but I think that the most important thing is that we have to intensify what was um, intended in 2018, to look at Africa as a place of opportunity, to look for win-win-win operations. Africans have to win, we have to win, and then society as a whole, the global society as a whole has, has, has to win. So that is the new, that is the new narrative, and, and we have to see how Europe can invest much more uh, in Africa, creating jobs, investing in the economy, uh, uh, developing links between Europe and Africa, for example, in terms of uh, academic collaboration um, do also as intensively as China is doing, as even Turkey is doing, Brazil is doing. Europe should look much more, especially also because of this proximity to Afri Africa as a continent of, uh, of opportunity. And for that, we have to work together more intensively also with the member states. And for that, I, I, I really applaud what uh, President uh, von der Leyen has launched in terms of the Team Europe uh, approach. Not the European Commission and then separately the member states, but having together with uh, the member states a joint, um, a, a joint approach, a, a, joint, a joint strategy. And not just the people within the Commission who are responsible for development cooperation, but also the people who are responsible for, for example, education, the people who are responsible and the services that are responsible for trade, the people that are responsible for culture, the people that are responsible for the digital evolution, the people that are responsible for economic development, transport, etc., etc., that a kind of a whole of agency that all services of the European Commission would get involved in this um, in this work with, uh, with with Africa. Let me give you t just two examples, if I, if I may, Gaia. Um, wh why do we have so many trade missions to Asia and to Latin America, and very few to Africa? If we see that Africa is the new continent, is the new market, is the new society, that will, to a, gra to a great extent, determine how the world will look like. If you look at demographics, you have to realize, you have to know, you have to believe that most probably the new Einstein will be African. So this is the continent of the future. So why do we only have trade missions to other continents? We have to multiply our contacts with Africa. Let me give another example, Corona. There are about 2 million Corona vaccines, vaccines available in Ethiopia, a country with over 100 million people. How can we ever think that our development will continue and that our welfare and our well-being being will continue if next to us, as I said, 14 kilometers away from us, there is a continent devastating, devastated by the corona crisis. So we, because of solidarity, but also because we know that we have a self-interest, we really have to invest in the continent. Indeed.
Indeed. Um, so you introduced a third polar, a pillar of development, the whole of society approach uh, that involves an ever growing range of state and non state actors collaborating. And with such a, a whole of society approach, the EU can truly differentiate its engagement with Africa. Thus, uh, what can be the concrete action for the EU to be a crucial actor in Africa, in the development sector, but also in the security sector? Yes, you know, so far, we always thought that everything that is not Europe or the developed world is something for development workers. It's for volunteers or professionals from the United Nations, from bilateral ministries for development cooperation, or from people from Oxfam or Médecins Sans Frontières and so on, just to go abroad and help. So these are what I call indeed the first, the second, and the third pillar of development cooperation, the people who are specialized in development cooperation. But now we see that there is um, an emerging fourth pillar with new organizations, new institutions, new initiatives, who also say, okay, what is happening there in Sri Lanka? What is happening there in Bolivia? What is happening there in, in, uh, in Guinea-Bissau, it's also of our interest. Let's do something. And this is what I called the four pillar. And I coined, I coined the term four pillar to say that those people are from a different generation. Um, so they see the world more as a globe, as one community, as one world. While the previous generations, and I say it with all due respect, they see the world as one being divided between the North and the South. And the task of development cooperation so far was to, for the North that has to help the South that has not. The North that has experience, that has uh, funds, that has uh, technology to support the South that has no experience, no funds, no technology. The new generation, the new initiatives that very often stem from local authorities that engage with other local authorities in the South, from social partners like trade unions from the North that work together with uh, trade unions from the South, from people from universities in the North that work with universities in the South, from people from uh, religious organizations in the North that work with people in, 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 in the South. They do it in a different way. Right. And you see, I mean, Bill Gates, is, Bill Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the best known, of course. Eh? And we see that they do it in a completely different way. It's much more human-centered. It's much more looking at opportunities, at success stories, not only at deficits and not only at, at what doesn't work uh, in, 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 in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. They go beyond just AIDS. They do other things. They trade, they exchange, they set up chat groups and etc cetera, etc cetera. and they go for win 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 operations they try to find mechanisms so that the people in this in the south the global south win uh, have benefits but also that they themselves they have benefits that they acknowledge that they have benefits and they go for mechanisms also that make for a society as, as a whole to win so that's the new that's the, the the new way of doing things, and this is indeed what I call the uh, whole of society approach. It's it's not only the so-called development cooperation specialists, the aid specialists that are on the scene, but you see a multitude of other ones also that are on, on, on the scene, and we have to cherish that. I mean, this is a good, this is really a good and a positive evolution. I'm an optimist. Yes, and this is uh, my last question. I would like to say that you seem to have a positive approach and thinking towards uh, this fourth pillar and development in Africa. Um, on the other hand, it seems to me that we can also see negative consequences of the EU engagement in Africa and also many African countries are dealing with political instability and fighting extremist groups. So what can be the real future for African countries? And so the EU has a, a role on that and what, what will be the role against, let's say, against China and the US? 
But you know, I, I, as, as I said, I'm, um, I'm an optimist and I think that optimism, I'm following Popper, eh? optimism is a moral duty. Eh? So this is how we have to look at, at, uh, at, at reality. But it doesn't mean to be an optimist, doesn't mean to deny that there are problems. The only thing is that you think you can overcome those problems. You're not a defeatist. You don't think that this is, we are suck into the problem. So you, you think you can go ahead and, 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 and find solutions to the, to, to the problems. And I think one of the important things that Europe has brought to the world is the fact of transparency. The fact that we want to, do, to have the things on the table and that everybody has access to what is on the table, that has access to all the information. So I think that for the world as a whole, this is something that Europe has to defend. The fact that we want everything to be transparent. We want to know what has happened in the murder of Sankara, the then president of Burkina Faso. The, 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 the court thing is going on to uh, one of the following days, but we want everything to be on the table. We want the human rights abuses to be on the table. We want to be on the table what is happening in some of the European member states, but also in some of the member states of the African Union. And on that basis, we want to have a fair and a good discussion if we find that this is morally acceptable or morally unacceptable. So I think that Europe has to be very frank in dealing with its own member states, but also with the member states of the African Union and also of the, of, of the other continents and have the things to put on the, on the table with each time again and again the question, do we think that this is morally acceptable? And we go beyond that. Do we think that we can say to our citizens that this is morally acceptable. If not, what are we going to do about it? Absolutely, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes our discussion for today. Professor De Veltere, I would like to thank you for taking the time to speak with us. It was a pleasure and an honor to have you as a guest. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank Good you. luck.